Hello everyone and welcome to another Top 5 Records video and today I'm going to be counting down the 50 best albums from 1968. I have an incredible bunch of records here. Uh, these are just 10 of the 50 that I've got lying here. I'm going to count down the 50 best albums from 1968. So without further ado, I'm going to start it off and I kick it off with a record you just saw. Laura Nairo, Eli and the 13th Confession. Now, this is an interesting listen, and it took me some time to get into. I bought it because it was in the book 1001 Elements You Must Hear Before You Die. And there is an element of unease when I listen to uh, her voice and um, the compositions, but there's also an element of an intriguing quality that grows on you. She's an incredible songwriter, and this album, I believe it's her first album, is fascinating. On number 50, Laura Naira wrote Eli and the 13th Confession. On number 49, I love this album. I think this is one of the best albums by the Birds. Sweetheart of the Rodeo. Now, there's something very interesting going on on this album. The birds were looking for a new direction, and what was going on? A brilliant musician came to their midst in the form of Graham Parson. And Graham Parson slowly but surely manipulated the band into playing country or country rock songs. And this man is a genius. He's a brilliant writer. He's a brilliant vocalist. And he has done so many great things later on with the Flying Burrito Brothers and Solo. But his first masterpiece, yeah, yeah, it's at number 49, but I'm going to call it a masterpiece nevertheless, is what he did with the birds. Now, it's only one album he did with the birds, but it's gorgeous. The birds, sweetheart of the rodeo at number 49. At number 48, one of the bands that influenced... Led Zeppelin. I have the first album by Spirit here. And I believe I was even lucky enough to find it in an original uh, American pressing. This is interesting and odd at the same time. It's not as good as 12 Dreams of Dr. Sardonius. I'm going to check it out. I have it lying here. 12 Dreams of Dr. Sardonicus. Um, yet, it does show somewhat of a hippie band at an intriguing moment in time and i love the way this captures their atmosphere uh the group their identity an awesome album spirits self-titled debut at 48 and at 47 another one that i first found out because of the book thousand one albums you must hear before you die and it took me quite some time to find this album the incredible string bands the hand the hangman's daughter not the handmaid's tale the hangman's beautiful daughter so many mistakes in one sentence interesting again a very interesting moment in time just as spirit and it is intriguing it captures a scene a moment love the album on number 47 the hangman's beautiful daughter by the incredible string band now on 46 a name that we will see later on again in this list. It's a Frank Zappa album. Yet this is credited. It's not really credited to. Yeah, it's credited to the Mothers of Invention here. With Zappa and the Mothers of Invention. But they're presenting themselves as Ruben and the Jets. And this is one of the rare occasions in which Zappa formed a fictional band. He later on did that or made a parody with Joe's Garage. It is a Zappa album, but he's doing a parody of the, the popular uh, kind of high school band. Ruben and the Jets is a very fun listen in that case. At 46, Cruising with Ruben and the Jets. At 45, Nancy and Lee. Um, Nancy Sinatra and Lee Hazelwood's album, Nancy and Lee. It's called The Hits of Nancy and Lee. Now, this is something I did not see coming. It was advised to me uh, at a record market here in Amsterdam at Waterloo Square. And these are just gorgeous, beautiful, warm and full sounding pop melodies. I love it. 
145 Nancy and Lee. And I gotta clean my glasses for a second because just a little bit of sweat dropped on them. Now I can see again, so I have all my focus for number 44. This is again fascinating territory. I love 1968. Neil Young's self titled debut. Must be honest, it's not Neil Young like uh, after the gold rush. Yet he is intriguing here. This is a fascinating album, and he has so many good songs. He's a good songwriter already here. Love this album. At number 44, Neil Young's Neil Young's self-titled debut. Now I'm gonna go for some jazz. But a rather particular jazz. It also took me a long time to find this album. Louis Armstrong's Disney Songs to Satchmo Way. I love this. I truly, truly love this. Because these are these light-hearted Disney songs. But putting them in the Disney versions with the with the typical voices or although they are sung always brilliantly. I mean I think Disney has made some incredible musicals, but I wouldn't easily put those songs on, although their melodies and their structures are very good. But when Louis Armstrong plays them, it is, it connects them, you know, you can put this on with people in, in the room and have a great time listening to it. It has a good atmosphere, it's coherent, but Louis Armstrong also catches the lightheartedness. It never becomes heavy or it never becomes serious jazz. It is lighthearted, fun jazz. And um, I just love when you wish upon, wish upon a, a star. Uh, chim chimery, chim chimery, chim chimery. Uh, Sipri doo da. Somewhat controversial right now. The Battle of Davy Crockett. I mean, this is a match made in heaven. Louis Armstrong and Disney. Yeah. Disney songs are such my way. On number 43. On number 42. That, how am I going to say this? Yeah. It's shade of, Shades of Deep Purple. But everyone will say you're holding the book of Talisin. Of, uh, uh, yeah. Talisin. That's right. I was in a record store in Bordeaux about a year ago. And I thought I was buying the book of Talisin in a first American or UK, it doesn't even read on the cover. Yeah, it's a first UK pressing. But when I got uh, back home, I noticed that it is actually a Parlophone, uh, yellow label Parlophone, Shades of Deep Purple. And that's the actual album that I'm putting here on this list. I, I want, Actually, I prefer to buy this than one above this one because this is amazing. And I've listened to it digitally, which was, it was okay. But listening to it on the first UK pressing in an okay, -ish, yeah, it's, a, it's an okay shape. Stereo. It's just spectacular. This is a psychedelic hippie moment in the world of Deep Purple. That's just mesmerizing. First of all, here, side one, um, there's a brilliant cover of I'm So Glad. There's a brilliant cover of Hush, which was a very big hit. I saw a video of them performing it at um, the, the Playboy Mansion. They did a great job, but I've never heard it as good as on this original album. It's spectacular. And then side two, Mandrake Root and Hey Joe, Help. They are, it's hippie pop. It's hippie pop done by Deep Purple before they became the hard rock band, but they were one incredible hippie band. So I'm keeping it because it's very tough to find the first UK uh, pressing of this album, Shades of Deep Purple. So I hope that one day I find just the cover of that album and then I'll have it complete again. But a number 42, despise this look, despite this cover shades of deep purple now on number 41 another gorgeous 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 record harry nielsen's aerial ballet from 1968 when the beatles went to america in 1968 
they asked him, what artists are you interested in? And all four said, Harry Nilsson. Why? They had just heard this album and it's of mesmerizing quality. It is a masterpiece. This record contains Everybody's Talking which was a very big hit in the film Midnight Cowboy. And if you hear it, then you'll, you'll recognize it. You know, everybody's talking at me. I don't have a word to say, only the, uh, I don't know the last words in a sentence. But then again, uh, later on, there's some, one is the loneliest number that you'll ever have. So many incredible melodies that have lived throughout cinema, throughout, uh, uh, through records, through tr through films, by somebody who refused to tour, somebody who refused to play live. These are incredible songs, sung by one of the most incredible vocalists of the '60s in America. Yeah, I'm saying it. I'm saying it without a doubt in my mind. This man was a genius, brilliant vocalist. And we're moving to number forty. This is, this is a mighty fine one. Taj Mahal, it's Taj Mahal. Um, known from, I believe it was Woodstock Festival, right? Awesome, awesome, awesome blues. What I have here is a American pressing. I'm not sure if it's a Firk. It's not a Firk because it's the later uh, uh, label, but it sounds incredible, beautiful, warm sounding blues. It's not the typical old blues, this man is altering it, giving it more to the hippie movement, and he does a mighty fine job. A lovely album. At number 40, Taj Mahal's self-titled debut. Now, another record with a festival connotation, as a matter of fact, recorded at a festival, Forest Flower, Charles Lloyd at Monterey. This, the Charles Lloyd Quartet. Um, this is a fascinating lineup. You have Charles Lloyd here, you have Keith Jarrett, uh, Cecil McBee and Jack the Jonet. Well, Keith Jarrett, a lot of people will know him because he did the famous Köln concerts. Also, a, a record in the Thousand One Elms You Must Before You Die book. This is a very beautiful pressing by Speaker's Corner. It's so good. I found an original a year or two ago, but for about 10 bucks, I thought I'm not going to take it because this one, Speaker's Corner, is just a mesmerizing good copy. Gorgeous, lighthearted, beautiful jazz and a very nice i mean that's the thing what do you get when you combine hippies with jazz well the answer can of course be found in miles davis and his bitches brew but here we have another answer lovely album at 39 i'm gonna go to 38 another blues element here but very very white blues but very very good and successful white blues at number 38 Jeff Beck's Truth. Now, I never loved this album the way I did until I heard this 45 RPM Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab pressing. There is so much going on here. Um, the voice of Rod Stewart, of course. The guitar of Jeff, Be Jeff Beck. Jeff Beck is an amazing guitar player. He knows how to give the, uh, the blues his, his, his own identity. But I was especially on this pressing, struck by what Rod Stewart is doing with the vocals. You shook me all night long. I mean, oh, it just goes through your soul and then ending up with, I ain't superstitious. Oh, this is some fascinating blues. I love it. At number 38, Truth by Jeff Beck. Ha. Um, yeah, 38. Then we have 37, Traffic. Again, one of those albums that I found out because uh, of the book, Thousand One Albums You Must Hear Before You Die. Again, great album, awesome, late 60s vibe. I love the hi hippie culture, but then I'm gonna leave it at that because um, time-wise, I'm, I'm gonna get into some trouble. So not too much attention for yet a very good album by Traffic. 36, I've got Towns Van Zandt's For the Sake of the Song. I'm so happy that finally I'll be, I'm talking about Towns Van Zandt on this channel. 
And I'll be doing more videos about him or about certain albums from him in the future because I'm hunting down some very nice uh, US pressings of his work. This is not a very nice pressing. It's a Charlie pressing, which is not a treat, but it's okay. And these records by Townsend's end are just so tough to find. But when you have one, you're treated to one of the most impressive songwriters. In my opinion, ever. This man was so skilled. This album, his first album, contains the first song that he ever wrote, Waiting Around to Die. Imagine writing something of that quality. A month ago, I was at a party and um, uh, I was unable to convince the people of the quality of Townsend's End. Then I quoted and, and co read because I started quoting. I, I needed uh, the lyrics waiting around to die and everybody at the table I mean they were all uh, filmmakers and storytellers they were impressed man this is a good lyric this is a good song with, without hearing the melody and I told them first song the man ever wrote first song the man ever wrote waiting around to die is it the only good song in the album oh no 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 it's packed for the sake of the song gorgeous record at number 36. We're gonna go to 35. The Soft Machines first album. Now, this is some psychedelic stuff. It's amazing. It's incredible. And um, I had someone over uh, a couple of weeks ago who was a very big psychedelic rock fan in the late 60s. And he would go to bands like Pink Floyd and the Soft Machine, and you would see them live during the time of black like, late 60s. And he said, you know, there was a big competition between the Soft Machine and Pink Floyd. You were either Team Pink Floyd or Team Soft Machine. He said he was clearly Team Soft Machine. And it's almost tough to imagine right now that there was big competition for Pink Floyd because Pink Floyd in the current day and age is one of the great big survivors of the rock scene and still defining um the uh, the record sales with something like darks of the moon but put this on and you'll understand what kind of competition they had at number 35 the soft machine self-titled debut on number 34 and i'm so happy that what i just had was a first american uh, issue but from the soft machine i want a first uk issue this is a first american issue of the band's music from Big Pink. I mean, just to feel the cardboard, to feel the thickness. Uh, as a matter of fact, there is a picture of Big Pink here. This is the place where the band was uh, rehearsing together with Bob Dylan. And Bob Dylan made the cover of this album. Horrible cover. <laughs> Sorry, I, can't, I'm, I, I, I think it, it, it looks like a child drawing. But it's very playful and I think I'm sure he was happy making it. The album itself is a lot better than that. There's no tracklist on the back and I do want to mention some titles so I'm going to get the final out. What we have here. Uh, Tears of Rage. The Weight. I mean, any album that has The Weight should be played. It's got such a beautiful timing. Such gorgeous melodies and the vocal is just incredible yeah and then a side two ends off with i shall be released a bob dylan song dylan is not on the album but the way they played it another bob dylan song by the way wheels of uh, wheels on fire is here which they record together um they did a lot of jamming in big pink that house and that also made a gorgeous album the basement tapes i'll be talking about that in my bob dylan series but this album has so many great moments. The way they do I Shall Be Released. The high pitch, but the complete energy on that, on that, I believe it's the chorus? Spot on. Then, to 33. This was a, was a very big hit back in the day. And it's a rather, can I say absurd album? In a certain way, yeah. It's Iron Butterflies in a Gala Vida. And In a Gala Vida is a 17-minute song with one 
main riff. And it doesn't seem to bore. It doesn't seem to bore. And it's it's a moment in the time in time, you know. Um, I did a video on 1967, a top 50 about a couple of months ago. And um, what you notice there is that you, you get an image of a moment in time, but also a moment of very articulate artists, just, just being um, very authentic in themselves. In this list, I have the idea more that it's, there are these articulate artists. So the album is more about the artist than about the time. There are some albums here like, like uh, Spirit, like Traffic, that are a lot about the time. And I think this one, Inagada Vida, is part of that. It has this deeply felt, nice, psychedelic rock vibe. I love it. And it's also somewhat a time machine, traveling towards the late 60s, where a track like Inagada Vida of 70 minutes is possible, and it is enjoyable. At number 33, Inagada da Vida by Iron Butterfly. Again, another very odd one, and I want to show it correctly because I have it here. Um, Arjun's Nuts Gone Flake by The Small Faces. Now, I'm trying to hold this as correctly as I can because this is very strange packaging. I already took the vinyl out. Um, yeah, it's it's circles etching, and then somewhere in between they put the record, but I gave it a good inner sleep because I do not want this vinyl to be uh, spoiled. It's a first Dutch pressing. It's very hard to find a first British pressing. It's a very odd record, a very odd record, yet it keeps on amusing, entertaining, and this is one of those records that really grows on you. I love that late 60s experiment. And this one is pretty nice. Arjun's Nuts Gone Flake. No, I, this, this, is, this is not easy to pronounce near Dutch. Arjun's Nut Guns Flake by the Small Faces. I think they must have made up that title just to annoy people from outside of Britain. Or is it even tough to pronounce when you're British? I'm not sure. Leave a comment below if you know how tough it is to pronounce. I'm going to go to the number 31. It's the crazy world of Arthur Brown. Now, this album, it's insane, but it has this element of psychedelia. It's a very energetic, awesome album. It's produced by Pete Townsend. Pete Townsend of The Who was an early fan of Arthur Brown, and this man just goes insane. It's such an awesome album. Also released on the track. A record label where the, the who was also working on that it got in a very nice shape it's a bizarre album and the thing is it's not just bizarre for the bizarreness arthur brown is clearly a, a, a talent clearly a talent with melodies and mostly i love his energy have you seen tommy the musical like pete townsend and the who they afterwards after they made the the music concept album uh, of Tommy. They later on made a musical film in 1975. Brilliant film. And then there's a song, Eyesight to the Blind, which is a cover of a Moe's Ellison song. And The Who play that song together with Eric Clapton, who does a brilliant guitar. But the vocals of the second half of the song are sung by Arthur Brown, and he lets loose everything. The man is insane, and it is awesome. On number 31, The Crazy World of Arthur Brown. Now I'm going to switch vinyls. We're going to go into the top 30. And on number 30, another track record. Because this is Cream's Wheels of Fire. Now this record is somewhat odd. It is the same with the Umaguma of Pink Floyd, although this is a lot better than Umaguma by Pink Floyd. One side is live, one side is studio. Now, let me start with the, with the live album. This 
track list done by Cream is pure awesomeness. Born Under a Bad Sign is on here. Crossroads is on here. Spoonful is on here. Toad is on here. Awesome, awesome blues songs. And then if you think you've had all awesomeness there, side one, the studio opens with White Room. In the White Room. The thing, when Ginger Baker, the drummer of Cream, died, that same day I went into the cinema and I saw Joker. The nineteen, not to two thousand nineteen, film with Joaquin Phoenix, and then near the end, when all hell breaks loose, they play that song in a white room. Man, at that moment in time, with this, with with the loss of Ginger Baker and that insanity in the film, it was a smack to the head. I was with a friend who did not know it, know that song, and he immediately loved it. A lot of great songs, by the way. Sitting on top of the world as well. Cream, Wheels of Fire. Awesome. And also, if you're going to buy this, go for the stereo one. I did a video which I compared the stereo to the mono one. So check it out. But in short, go for stereo. But nevertheless, of course, you, sh you should try and watch it. Because more views from my channel. Um, <laughs> on number 29. John Mayles Blues from Laurel Canyon. John Mayle, the British blues legend, went to Laurel Canyon and made one of the most chilled blues albums ever. Somehow, and that's always the thing with blues, I think the step from blues, from black blues to white blues, can be tough. Do you manage to put an own identity into the blues? Because these original recordings or these these chess record recordings they are so powerful john mayle found a certain ease a certain un undivinable calm that is most noticeable for me on this one the way he's talking about the scenery the way he's talking about emotions it is of such an utter chill that for me, this is a, a summer, a holiday album. And with the summer coming up, I'm going to be playing this one. Blues from Laurel Canyon by John Mayo. On number 28, The Beach Boys, Friends. Now, I find this a particularly interesting period in the world of The Beach Boys. They had lost their puppiness, their, their surf identity, which I obviously loved. And they were exploring different ter territories, just like the Rolling Stones and the Beatles, mostly the Beatles and Bob Dylan did, yet somehow they were not that um, successful in that regard. And I do not fully understand why, because this is a very good album. And if you haven't heard it, please give it a spin. On 28, the Beach Boys, Friends. On 27, I believe this is pretty obscure. It took me a lot of time to find it because I actually bought it because um, it was uh, handed over to me as a tip online. Uh, Michael Fremer was talking about this very enthusiastically in a video. Uh, and it's called John Renborn, Sir John a lot of Merry England's Musk Thing and Ye Queen Knight. Horrible title, incredible album. This is sound-wise brilliant. It's a bizarre album, a beautiful, beautiful new album to explore if you haven't um, already. But I, I'm assuming you haven't because it took me so much time to find it. And, uh, and Fremer already talked about how obscure it was and how tough to find. And then after a long search, I found it in, in Brussels and I love it. And at number 27, this album by John Renburn because or I'm just going to call it Sir John a lot because I'm not going to break my tongue again on that one. I have a lot of tongue breakers this, this video. It's good for my learning the language on 26. Now, I'm almost going to call this punk rock en vain la lettre. Yeah, I'm going to call it punk rock, rock en vain la lettre. Blue cheer with Vinic Buzz Eruptum. 
Now, this is one of the most fascinating trios in rock music. When you put this record on, you will get the best rendition of Summertime Blues ever. And I'm a The Who fan. I've heard that song for the first time uh, by The Who. Yet, and uh, I love the Eddie Cochran version as well, the original. But the way this rocks off. Lord, I got to raise a fuss. Lord, I got to raise a holler. About a working all summer just to try to win a dollar. It's so punky in its attitude. It's got so much balls. And the entire album is a very powerful release. I just really, really love it. On 26, Blue, Jeer, uh, Blue Cheers, Vinic Bus Eruptum. Again, a tongue breaker. This album is going to cost me my my speech. Or this album, this video is going to cost me my speech. This one's going to be a lot easier to pronounce. On number 25, The Doors. Waiting for the sun. This album has so many good moments. It starts off with, hello, I love you. Uh, love Street. That's, I do embrace that as a good love song. It's seldom that you hear Jim Morrison so direct. At least that's what, the way I, 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 I listen to it. That wasn't cynical, right? The way he sings Love Street. Summer's Almost Gone. Wintertime Love. The Unknown Soldier. I think that's one of the best and most overlooked songs by The Doors. Wait until the war is over. And we're both a little older. Then side two over to Spanish Caravan. And it ends with five to one. It has We Could Be So Good Together in the Middle. There are so many just incredible songs on this album. Uh, I wish I had original. This is a very good and interesting reissue. It's even numbered, but I want to find an original because this is an amazing album. I'm 25, The Doors, Waiting for the Sun. I'm 24, The Reverend Gary Davis at Newport. Hear me out. It opens with Samson and Delilah. And this, then you are introduced to a musician, a folk blues musician that has his soul so deeply wrenched into the roots of America that it is almost impossible to put this album off. It's as if you are stepping into a time machine, getting into an audience, and you are watching a troubadour, somebody who has walked the lands and who is telling you the story of everything that he saw. It is so deeply, deeply effective. And then it ends off with, I will do my last singing in this land, Lord, somewhere. It's almost gospel what he's doing. Perhaps it is a gospel song. I mean, he's irreverent. Put it on. If you haven't heard that version of the song, pause this video right now. Open another tab and listen to I Will Do My Last Sing in This Land. Lord Somewhere. Yeah, Lord, he doesn't have any title, but he does sing it. It's so deep. It's so good. At number 24, Reverend Gary Dave is at Newport. At number 23, we have another moment for the birds the notorious bird brothers now i think this is the finest moment in the history of the birds their sound is so much deeper their melodies are so much more developed there are such incredible songs here like i think i'm going back to the place i learned so well in my youth. Oh, an amazing, gorgeous album. By the Birds on number 23. On number 22. 
the United States of America, their self-titled first album. These guys are insanely skilled musicians and they are giving you, well, I believe it's somewhat of a protest album. It's very cynical. It's very developed. It's an amazing album. A couple of years ago, I believe it was one of the last interviews that uh, Henny Frinten, uh, I'm not sure if anyone knows Dumar, but Dumar was one of the biggest bands. It was the biggest band in the 80s here in the Netherlands. And uh, their bass player and uh, main vocalist, Henny Frinten, he died. And he was summing up, I believe, the 10 most influential albums to him. And he was, that, that man was good with melody. That man was good with bass. That man was good with melody. And that man was good with getting the right soul into an album. He is a European legend, seriously. Um, he mentioned this as one of the best and most influential albums ever. So if you haven't heard it, try it. You're going to love it. At 22, United States of America, their self-titled album. And we're going to end off the 20s with a masterpiece. Again, there's so many masterpieces in 1968. Bookends by Simon and Garfunkel. Why this one? I think it's one of the best albums by Simon and Garfunkel. And we're just at 21 here. I'm so fascinated by the song America, for example. Let us be lover, we'll marry our fortunes together. I've got some real estate here in my back. So he bought a pack of cigarettes and Mrs. Wagner spies and walked off to look for America. The, the melodies, the rhythm, the the way, obviously the way they sound together, but I'm, I'm, I'm even just focused by the way it was initially written. There is a beautiful cover version of this done by David Bowie at the concert for New York in, I believe, 2001 or 2002. Um, and he sits down on this, this, this very simple keyboard. And he it's a, a child's keyboard, you know, like, like with five or six notes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it just shows the strength of the, the lyrics and the melody uh, you, but you could also realize it just putting on this album and it's it's got so many more old friends incredible song i believe he played that uh, during his final show in amsterdam paul simon played that during his final final show in amsterdam so much more uh hazy shade of winter mrs robinson obviously and at the zoo masterpiece of songwriting and harmony let's give our garfunkel some credits as well at number 21 bookends and we're going into the number 20 till 10. i'm gonna have to explain the next one to you because having things like the birds in the united states of america the Doors, Bookends, uh, by Simon and Garfunkel, just before this title. I need to give you an explanation. But I'm going to give it to you. It's God Bless Tiny Tim. It's the first album by Tiny Tim. Now, Tiny Tim is not always taken seriously. And perhaps he didn't want to be taken seriously. Because he was constantly playing with an ele element of... of childish imaginary um nonchalance um childish uh, um, yeah he also did a television show for children yet he hated children he wanted to live in when i listen to him i i have the idea that he wanted to live in a a a, a playful simpler world in a certain way but that doesn't make his music simple it is complex and he's doing some incredible things here. The first thing on this album is Welcome to My Dream, which is a beautiful opener and brings you to what I read as late 50s kind of family television. But there's more to it because Tiny Tim is really inviting you over to his world. And there's a quirkiness. There's a, a something odd here. There, It seems to be lighthearted and he plays with lightheartedness and then he can bite you in your ass with deeper emotion but it's not that's not happening in the second song second song tiptoe through the tulips with me um 
first time I heard that was actually in that film Insidious. And there it is a haunting, masterful, dangerous tune, which in its lightheartedness just seems to be embracing complete insanity. I, as a matter of fact, when I was living in a student home, I used to play it on my ukulele and do the high voice as well, better than I just did. And there were people who were using substances which would make the mind go whoop whoop. And they demanded that I would stop because just playing that song for them <laughs> made them go into a trip of insidious. I love that song. Uh, living in the sunlight, loving in the moonlight, having a wonderful time. It's the third song, gorgeous. On the old front porch, but well, don't get angry on the old front porch. Now stop. He does the male voice and the uh, female voice at the same time. He switches uh, the, the, the orchestra, the instrumentation, all brilliant here. Then the Viper, which is mainly just a joke. He's, he's putting a joke in there. Stay down where you belong. Pa, 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 pa. So many good melodies. There I'd be satisfied with life. Strawberry tea, then the other side. Uh, ever since you told me that you love me. Gorgeous song. It's brilliant. Daddy, daddy, what is heaven like? That's going to break your heart. That's going to break your heart. If you are cynical about this record at number 20, put on daddy, daddy, what is heaven like? And tell me that this man does not have a very good artistic vision or is going to make you shred to tears. Such a great song. The coming home party. Fill your heart. I got you, babe. Again, a duet with himself. This is all I ask. Tiny Tim with made one masterpiece, and we should be grateful for that. On 20, God bless Tiny Tim. And God bless everyone. It's of course a reference. I only realized it just now. It's a reference to a Christmas carol. God bless Tiny Tim. And then Tiny Tim in a Christmas carol says, God bless all of us. Now we're getting to number 19. Pink Floyd, a saucer full of secrets. I mean, Pink Floyd is looking for a new sound here. They were saying goodbye to Sid Barrett, who still has one song on there, the Jug Band Blues, but they were searching for a new identity. And in that process, they made songs like Set the Controls for the Heart of the Sun and A Saucer Full of Secrets. Anybody listening back then, listening to this record, could have known they would become one of the biggest bands in the world. This is the beginning of brilliance. On number 19, A Saucer Full of Secrets. And number 18, the ending of brilliance. Because this is the final album by Otis Redding, The Dark of the Bay, and I believe it was released after his death. Um, they had to finish some songs like Sitting on the Dock of the Bay. Everybody knows that song. The whistling was done because Otis Redding could not finish singing the vocals himself because he had died during, wasn't it a plane crash? I believe it was a plane crash. That's not the only good song here. This album is packed. It's good. It's great. It's Otis Redding's final record. At number 18, Dock of the Bay. Number 17. I'm going to put some Johnny Cash in here at Folsom Prison. In case you haven't heard the story, I might just tell it again. Johnny Cash in the late 60s realized that music was going through changes. Bob Dylan went electric and um, there was something named Outlaw Country. Now Johnny Cash had spent a night in jail or something like that. It wasn't a big conviction, but he got letters from... Uh, um, inmates that they recognize themselves in his music so he thought I'm gonna have to be playing for them I'll be recording a live album for them it was rather controversial but the atmosphere that creates when he is getting on stage and he does Folsom Prison Blues it's the first song I hear the train are coming it's going around the bend and I ain't seen the sunshine since I don't know when I'm stuck in Folsom Prison. And time keeps dragging on. But that rail keeps on rolling to down, San, down to San Antoine. When I was just a baby, my mama told me, son, always be a good boy. Don't ever play with guns. But I shot a man in Reno. 
just to watch him die. When I hear that whistle blowing, I lean my head and I cry. If you can write something like that, if you can perform that in front of an audience of people who recognize it, I mean, of course I do not condole or, or think it's, it's a good thing to do, the things he's singing about, but that emotion, that writing, man, something's going on. And the entire record is of that quality with 25 minutes to go when he's counting down the moments until the main character is being hung by his head. The cocaine blues early one morning while taking my rounds, I took a shot of cocaine and I shot my woman down. <laughs> I mean, damn, this guy is dark. He is dark. He's dangerous. Then the dirty old ex sucking dog. <laughs> and then with uh, Jackson and Give My Love to Rose with June Carter. It will break your heart. It's so good. And then I got stripes, stripes around my shoulder. These melodies. That's the thing with these songs. I mean, the lyrics are good, but the moment I see a title, I just want to sing the melodies because they're so good. They're so catchy. Johnny Cash is doing some of his best work on this album. On number 17, Folsom Prison. Number 16. In my opinion, the best work by Dr. John. Dr. John, the night stripper, Greek read. I bought this album at Waterloo Square, Amsterdam. I got home, I cleaned it, I put it on, and I was hypnotized for the full length of this album. Dr. John is in such musical control. And at moments, he is very sincerely grabbing you. And at moments, he's just playing games with you. And he's, both these moments, they are so incredible nice. There's a vibe going on there. He's using musical influences that you've never heard return to rock. Or is this even rock? I'm not sure how to call it. It's a masterpiece of of writing and recording and dr john is insanely good here number 16 gregory by dr john the night tripper number 15 another in my opinion unsung hero of the american later songbook it's melanie with her first album born to be sadly melanie passed away uh, in January of this year, I was uh, working on a documentary about her and I'm working again on it. It will be uh, shorter than I imagined because obviously she passed away, so she, we couldn't be filming everything we wanted. One of the moments that I initially fell in love with her music is this album. With side A, In the Hour, then I'm Back in Town, you got Bobo's Party, then a beautiful rendition of Mr. Tambourine Man, and then number five, Mama, Mama. Melanie is young here. She is very young. And the way she wrote and shouted, sung, shouted, Mama, Mama, is one of the most mesmerizing, powerful moments in singer-songwriter history. And that's not just the only amazing moment. I mean, Mama Mama impresses with, with the vocal range and, and her conviction. Then side B opens with I Really Loved Harold, in which she gives a nuanced, honest and in-depth analysis of her love life, of her love experiences and of all the ambiguities there. I would not be able to pronounce my own love life like that. And I'm double her age from what she's there. I'm 34. I think she was 16 or 17 at the time when she wrote that. She was a philosopher. She, she, she was. She was a lyricist, a philosopher. Then Animal Crackers. Incredible song. Close to it all is really good. And ending off with Merry Christmas, you know why? Because she really loved Christmas. Man. Born to Be is a magical album. On number 15. And from one brilliant vocalist to another it's big brother and the big brother and the holding companies cheap 
thrills with some of the most insane vocals by Chenis Chaplin. Now, there are no lyrics of uh, no track list on the back, so I'm gonna get the final out so I can say something about these songs. Well, I do know Summertime on this record will blow your mind away. It's the way the guitar starts. And then the way Janis Chaplin hits Summertime and the Livings Easy. I think that's one of the most gorgeous summer songs ever. She is so insanely good there. Um, yeah, there's Summertime, there's Peace of My Heart on this album. Then um, Ball and Chain. Feels like a ball and chain. And it goes on and on and on. Oh, this album feels like in its entirety like like summer like like free hippie love and summer but not like an unreachable summer i could go sit in the park put this album on i have to carry a record player then but open your windows put this on and it's summer all night long <laughs> on number 14 cheap thrills by big brother and the holding company then I go to number 13. I wish I had some water for this video. I need some water in between moments because I do want to keep on talking and talking and talking about these albums. But um, nah, when I finish this video, I'll, I'll get me a glass of water. Also take a good breath because every title I just grab, I'm just so enthusiastic. All these memories of, of songs and, and moments when I put them on and I love them, they just come back to me. And same with this one, The Blue Juice of Latif. Mm -hmm. It's what Yusuf Latif is doing here on this album. He's combining influences in a jazz blues like album, which has a rhythm. Sometimes this this there, there's this, this it's a genre like the slave uh, the slave song, which is the or how do I say it correctly? Um, slave made songs. Um, at least before it became the blues, it's it's these hymns. It's there, there's a certain rhythm to it, and it has this deeply rooted, strong vocal attack on there. It's he, it's audible in here, and when this album opens, that rhythm, that melody with uh, a harmonica. My, my my dog loved that harmonica. Layla, she just started uh, singing along to the harmonica. That vibe is all over this album. I think this is one of the best. Yeah, I'm gonna say it. I think it's one of the best jazz albums ever. Yusuf Latif is a brilliant master in his craft here. And this album keeps on surprising. It's a gift that keeps on giving. On number 13, the blue Yusuf Latif. On number 12, I'm gonna go to we'll talk about the Velvet Underground here. Number 12, the Velvet Underground, white light, white heat. A more difficult Velvet Underground album. I think uh, the Velvet Underground and Nico that came before this one is easier accessible, yet this one it really gives. White Light, White Heat, the title track. I'm holding the first UK pressing, by the way. No, the second UK pressing, by the way. It doesn't have a nice black cover. Um, I'm looking for an original though, but isn't everyone looking for original Velvet Underground records? Gonna get back to the track list. White Light, White Heat. There is an insanity in that song and a dryness in the vocals that is just amazing. Then there's a story, uh, uh, Lady Godiva's operation, the gift. Here she comes now. I heard her call my name and Sister Ray, 70 minutes of brilliance as the final song. The Velvet Underground just made masterpiece after masterpiece and you're never completely sure what you're gonna get. The influence of John Cale is very big here. Thank God, John Cale. On number 12, White Light, White Heat. I'm gonna go to number 11, Aretha Franklin, Aretha Lady Soul. Look at the way she's shining on this picture. She is a daring musician. 
She has so much power, and this is one of her best albums. Chain of Fools opening this record. Bam! You're there. And this little since you've been gone. And you make me feel like a natural woman. The end of side one. This album has so many great soul songs. Aretha Franklin at one of her best moments in time. I love it. On number 11, Aretha Franklin's Aretha Lady Soul. And we're gonna hit the number, the top 10 territory here. I gotta change it around because the way I had it now, I had the number one at the front. But if I would be giving away the number one right now, that would be pretty bad of me. On number 10, Van Morrison, Astral Weeks. Took me by surprise. Took me by surprise. Sometimes these days it's tough to put on Van Morrison. I find that because his last album, he is clearly steering in different directions than what I would love him to do. This is just pure magic. Van Morrison was in touch with pop on one hand, jazz on another hand, blues on another hand, and the moment in time certain hippie psychedelica it blended over into one gorgeous masterpiece of an ambiguous album and this will set your mood holding it right now i'm thinking first thing i should do after recording this video i'm gonna put this on i'm gonna lay this aside it's nice hot weather it's the right album for this moment on number 10 astral weeks by van morrison at number nine Something I'm not going to play on a sunny day. One of the most dark albums ever. As a matter of fact, this has been described as the beginning of gothic rock. Gothic rock? No. Gothic romance. You know, the gothic romance. Nico's The Marble Index. Nico went away from the Velvet Underground. And she recorded her first album before this one. She was not too proud with, this album, with that album because it was much more of a pop album. Now, with the Marble Index, she worked together with John Cale as her uh, producer, and it also says he uh, did the arrangements. That's strange. Here it's uh, read that the uh, producer is Fraser Mohawk, but I've always heard and people talk about it as a John Cale production. Now, what was going on? What was happening? Nico was looking for her own sound, and then she met um, what's that? Leonard Cohen. And Leonard Cohen gave or sold her um, her first uh, harmon harmonium. And then she started playing that instrument with a certain breathing quality to that instrument. She developed a focal style around it. That is completely insane. There are so much haunting tunes here. It's such a deeply felt, deeply rooted atmospheric experience put this on in september or october and you'll have halloween in music without horrible or, or horrifying lyrics it's just haunting quality a gothic romance a dark romance the marvel index is a masterpiece at number nine at number eight Another oddball, Captain Beefheart and his magic band, Strictly Personal. Now, this is one of the most underrated albums by Captain Beefheart. The album he did before this was brilliant. The album he did afterwards was brilliant. Here he still has some awesome blues influences and melodies that are just stunning. The man was a genius. And... You can listen to this without loving the insanity of things like um, Troop Mass Replica or Let My Decals Off Baby. Here we have a man who was in love with Howlin' Wolf and good tunes and he knew how to make a good album. On number 8, Strictly Personal by Captain Beefheart and his magic band. On number 7. 
Jimi Hendrix, the Jimi Hendrix Experience, Electric Ladyland. And I'm holding this version up because if I would hold the original, uh, I've, I've got a Dutch first pressing here with naked ladies on the front. And um, YouTube is not so kind to us. Naked ladies in videos. But this is a very good remaster, as a matter of fact. One of the big Jimi Hendrix masterpieces. He's doing insanely great stuff here. This album has uh, Voodoo Child. Um, Voodoo Child, Slight Return, both brilliant songs. All Along the Watchtower, Gypsy Eyes. Thing is, you should just put this on. Double album. Lay back, get yourself a drink, and let them all come over you because the Jimi Hendrix experience at this point could give a musical experience that is unlike any, any other. This album is a masterpiece of timing, atmosphere. You can hear people in the studio just sitting there listening and chilling. It is a legendary moment in hippie culture. At number seven, the Jimi Hendrix experience, Electric Lady.